On this episode of Chemistry Matters, we're visiting a water treatment plant because this is a place where professional scientists actually separate materials based on their physical and chemical properties. And that's very important in the world of chemistry. We all benefit from chemical processes like this. For example, this plant executes chemical processes through which we recycle and clean our drinking water. And that leads me to something I bet you didn't know. The water molecules you're drinking today may be the same molecules that were in your toilet a few weeks ago. Tastes good to me. Welcome back to Chemistry Matters. The chemical and physical properties of matter are really important, even with everyday things like drinking a glass of water. We use the title Chemistry Matters for this series because not only is chemistry the study of matter, but chemistry really does matter in our everyday lives. So since matter matters, you might be wondering, what is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. In this unit, you'll learn about physical and chemical properties of matter. You'll learn how these chemicals mix together and how they can be separated from each other. And you'll be given the task of designing a method to separate a mixture of materials based on what you've learned about how matter works. As we learn more about chemistry, we'll be helping you recognize common concepts found in all parts of science and engineering. We call these cross-cutting concepts. We'll point these out to you as we continue in this unit. And by the end of this unit, you'll know how to recognize them on your own. So let's get back to our classroom to learn a little bit more about the basic properties of matter. What is matter? Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So technically, we're all matter. I mean, everything from your clothing to your smartphones to video games to makeup, they're all made up of atoms and they're matter. But I have a question for you. Can you think of anything that isn't matter? What about air? Well, why do you think air isn't matter? Well, you can't see air and you can't feel it. Ah, but what about wind? What about wind? Think about it, guys. If air is moving, you notice that the air can hit other objects and cause them to move. Air is composed of atoms, so air is matter too. Can anyone else think of something that isn't matter? How about electricity? Great example, great example. Electricity is energy, and energy is not matter. I mean, light, heat, x-rays, all forms of energy, they're not matter. So on a different note, um, technically love isn't matter either, but most people think love matters. OK. Now, there's a lot to study about matter. So let's break this into smaller pieces. And I'll give you some ways to classify and separate kinds of matter. This should make it just a little bit easier to study. But first, we need to understand physical and chemical properties and changes. This will really help us out with our classifying. So matter has different physical properties. A physical property is a characteristic that can be observed or measured without changing the chemical makeup of a substance. So this dish and this beaker of water, this will act as a small system model for us. Now let's define a system under study, which provides us with tools for understanding and testing ideas. To simplify it, a system can be something like an organism, a cat, a dog, atoms, planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, the solar system. Um, they can be machines, ideas, equations. But this system is simply a beaker of water and a few chemicals. So look at the dish on the desk and look at the water. Describe the powder's physical properties. But now let's keep this very simple. Imagine you're talking to a little brother or a little sister, OK? Describe the physical properties that the powder has. It's red. It smells sweet. It's grainy. Good. Well, now describe the properties, the physical properties of this water. It's liquid. It's clear. It doesn't have a smell. Great. All of those are physical properties. You mentioned color, clarity, and odor. Now pour the powder into the water. Have any of the properties changed? Yeah, and the water's red now. The texture of the powder isn't the same. I think it dissolved in the water. 
Yeah, the powder in the water might have formed a new substance, but it's really hard to tell without more information. Good. We really need to know more about what's going on with these physical properties of these substances. Remember what a physical property is? It's a characteristic that can be observed without changing the chemical makeup of a substance. Look at that. The list of physical properties our students came up with was really good, but here are some that might be less obvious. As you can see, some physical properties are well known and are easily observed, such as color, odor, and texture. Some physical properties, such as boiling point, melting point, and density, are not as well known and we often need tools or instruments to measure them, but they can be very important in helping to identify chemicals. Density is a physical property that's particularly important in helping to identify elements and compounds because each element has its own density. Density equals mass divided by volume, and we often measure density in grams per milliliter. For now, just know that density is the amount of mass per unit of volume. Put more simply, it's how tightly matter is packed together. To give you a better understanding of density, Let's use these beakers filled with water. Matter that has a density greater than water will sink to the bottom. Matter that is less dense than the water will float. So go ahead and drop in the fishing weight and the bobber into the water. As you'd expect, the weight goes straight to the bottom. And that's because it's more dense than the water. On the other hand, the fishing bobber floats because its density is much lower than water. So it floats, otherwise it wouldn't be much useful to the fishermen. The weight and the bobber are similar in size, but why do you think the densities are so different? Because the fishing weight is a lot heavier than the bobber. Why is that important to density though? You said that density has to do with mass and volume. The weight and bobber have similar volumes, but since the weight is heavier, the masses have to be different. Great thinking. What do you think the egg will do when you put it in the water? I'm not too sure, but I'm ready to drop it in and see. Well, eggs seem pretty heavy, so I think it'll sink. The grape, anyone? Will it sink? Will it float? I'm gonna guess it floats. Yeah, grapes are so little, they'll float. Hmm, it looks like the grape also has a higher density than water. So it went straight to the bottom. Now, let's try ice cubes. You've probably seen ice floating a lot in water. The ice cube floats because it's less dense than water, which is very unusual because solids typically are more dense than liquids. So why are solids usually denser? That is a great question. Why are solids usually denser than liquids? In most cases, when a solid forms from a liquid, the particles pack more tightly together, which means the same amount of matter takes up less space. But water expands when it freezes. When water expands, the molecules spread out, changing the density. The ice takes up more volume, but the same amount of matter is there, so its mass stays the same. And the density of ice is lower than the density of liquid water. This is an example of the cross-cutting concept called cause and effect. You'll use it a lot in science. All events have causes, sometimes simple, sometimes complex. An important role of a scientist is investigating the cause of events and the mechanisms by which they occur. Objects that float on water have lower density than water. We use those materials to build life jackets that help us float. And we can build ships out of strong metals like iron if we shape them so they hold a lot of air, which has a much lower density than water. For now, the important thing to remember is that every element has its own unique density, and density is a very important physical property. So let's use the physical property of density to help identify two metals. The purpose of this lab is to identify the metals found in pennies by measuring their densities. To determine density, we need to measure volume and mass for pre and post 1982 pennies. We'll determine the two average densities and graph our data. So let's get out to our classroom and get started. At your lab stations, you have an electronic balance with all the materials you need to complete the lab. 
you have pre-1982 pennies, post-1982 pennies, and a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. Now, to measure volume, you're gonna to need to fill the graduated cylinder with 30 milliliters of water. Then you'll drop a penny into the graduated cylinder and measure the new volume. The difference will be the volume of the penny. Don't forget to dry off your pennies. If there's extra water on them, it can mess up your calculations. Oh, and make sure when you use a balance, you re-zero it every time. While our students are measuring the density of pennies, you can do this lab yourself in your own classroom with the help of your teacher. Collect and graph the density data from your pennies and compare your data to the reference chart provided by your teacher. That should help you identify the metals. When you're done, move on to the next video in the playlist and we will see you there.